Uh, everyone, give one big welcome to Kenneth Sutherland. Okay, notes to my younger self. Hi, I'm Kenneth Sutherland, and if I was to go back in time and talk to myself for half an hour about tips and lessons, that's essentially what this is going to be. So, to give you a rough overview of where this is coming from, I put up the various positions I've had for the past 20 years. My first 10 years as a developer, I've had roughly one role per year. Then the last 10 years, I've only had one role. And during that time, I've done permanent employee. I've also been a, a contractor as well. So I've gone between the two. So we don't have time to discuss the pros and cons of that just now. But if you want to ask me that later, more than happy to discuss it. Now, over that time span, you meet people, people who have really strong opinions. Some people can be really, really quiet. You can almost like, tease the ideas out of them. You get people that may be funny, and you get people that just get on your nerves. So how on earth can you build a collaborative team out of that? And change, change happens all too often. And sometimes it's not change that you wish to have. And again, how do you get the most out of that as a developer? And is there one thing that you can do to make your job more enjoyable. After all, we spend an awful lot of time with our colleagues at work. I probably spend more time chatting to my colleagues than I do my other half at times. So I believe there is one thing you can do, and we'll come to that later. Now, the first thing I would do if I went back, I had to tell myself that getting a job after university, it's hard. It took me a year to get my first proper role. So what could I have done to make my journey get started sooner? What I should have done was, after leaving uni, I should have spent more time getting into code. And what I mean by that is, you can go online, and there's lots of tutorials out there, and like to-do lists and so on, but they're a bit boring. They're not going to keep you up all night doing that kind of stuff. You're much better off. Think of your hobbies, think of your pastimes, and if you can get something like that, that'll give you the passion, the drive, then go and develop something just on your own. Now, it may be that someone else has already done it. Don't bother with that. It has to be your idea, and then you develop that. And once you have your idea, I would thoroughly recommend going out and getting a whiteboard, pens, and a sticky note. Now, these are the kind of things that I certainly wasn't taught when I went to university. They teach you about how to code, but not how to do the practices around it. So you get your idea, then with that, you split it down into a couple of epics, split those down into individual tasks, put them on your sticky notes, and put them up on your board, a physical board. In doing so, that gives you the sort of real satisfaction of moving it along from your to-dos to your dones. It also teaches you about best practices. How do you prioritise something? You know, you'll do a task, and I'd highly recommend, I know people, I've interviewed people, they don't even do this in their actual jobs. You know, people are moving from one job to another. So I thoroughly recommend, if you don't have an electronic version of this, get an actual physical board. It makes a difference. And in doing so, you can then get your behavioural practices. You can think about what you're doing. And when it comes to getting an interview, you'll have a real-world example. Even though you've never done a job, this is a real-world example. And they can ask you, well, how do you prioritise something? How do you teach yourself something? What happens when you've hit a blocker and then you've got to think about it again? You have to rejig things. These are ideal things to then get into uh, a, a position. Now, I did games at university. So my first job was in a games company with a AAA title doing Medal of Honor. Now, this is always super exciting as a developer. You know, what better thing do I do than making games? So the place was in Scotland. They were doing the cooperative mode, and America were doing the single player mode. So but unknown to me, because I was a very naive programmer at the time, was essentially the place was going downhill very fast. But I didn't realize that. So the first few weeks, everybody had headphones on. You know, because they're in the zone. Why were they in the zone? Because there was literally thousands of bugs. When I went in, I was shown a spreadsheet, and there really was thousands of bugs. And because everyone had their headphones on, there was no support. I think my entire time in that place, I maybe had one, two meetings with management to see how I was getting on. So it was like a nightmare environment for a junior developer coming in. What on earth am I doing? This massive code base, which you know you've never encountered before because at uni you only get tiny little projects. So in that regard, you know. It was just terrible. And to make matters even worse, the entire team then left to go to America. 
to join up the single player team, but I was getting married, so I couldn't go. So I was stuck in an office working American hours. You know, it was fine. I was, I was just happy. I was getting pizza, takeaways each night, all on the company expenses. I spent, you know, they'd come back eventually, and it'd all be all good. But no, it wasn't. So there's me sitting there. Yep, everything's fine. Essentially, the place is on fire, but I didn't realise it. And obviously, the game got released. Then the guys come back, and then half of them got made redundant, including myself. So, other than saying, you know, life sucks, what can you get out of that? So, if a place feels like chaos, it probably is. So, you have to look for an exit strategy. What I should have been doing was I should have been looking at the code, taking out chunks of it, because there's massive design patterns in there that I hadn't experienced. I should have been pulling them out, putting them into small individual units, and trying to debug them, put tests around them, and trying to just figure out what was going on, so I could teach myself things to then bring on to another position. In the end, I was almost like coasting, which is not really what you want to do. In terms of learning, I'd say to anyone here that is a sort of manager or senior person, you've got to support your junior developers. Like, I don't understand why on earth you spend the time hiding, going through CVs, all that stuff, only to then completely ignore them and just leave them wondering what on earth are they doing. And headphones. I know developers love to have headphones to get in the zone to code, but in an office environment, they're really not the best thing for turning around and actually asking people ideas. So if you do have to have them, take them off and just go and ask someone, are you doing okay? And later on, there's one firm I worked with and they had a great solution to this, but we'll come to that later. And for you as the junior developer, there's never learning in isolation. So I would say never stop asking questions. You know, don't ask the same questions, but never stop asking questions. Because even as someone comes in and they speak to perhaps me, a senior developer, and ask questions, then I've got to remember something. Because if they're looking at the code, then obviously it's not clean code if they're not understanding it. And I might look at that and go, OK, that needs refactored. So it's good for people to be asking senior developers questions as well as you learning at the same time. So now we jump on like five years. Another couple of sessions have passed me by. I've gone through them. I'm now in a digital web agency. And one of the senior manager web developers has gone and created an app. But they didn't quite get the paradigm shift between web pages and application development. So I came in with my expertise and I was asked to make it work. So I looked at it and I said to them, well, this needs to be completely scrapped and rewritten. Now, again, I didn't have the experience then to understand that when someone's been working on something for six months, nine months, even though they knew it wasn't good, they've got a personal attachment to that code. So me coming in and saying it needs to be scrapped was a no-go. So they said, no, you're not doing that. You need to refactor it. So that's what I did. But I shouldn't have done that. All too often as a developer, we just jump into the code. I shouldn't have. I should have stopped and taken note of something. And I should have done might what I call it a request for change, RFC, or a root cause analysis. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. I should have documented what was wrong with the existing app and the benefits of the new app. At the same time, I could talk to the stakeholders because that was already there. So the client had seen it. So I should have been asking them what do they like, not like. And I put all these things in some sort of formal documentation, taking that to then management and said, this is your choices. And at the end of the day, that would make it much easier to decide the correct route. But I said, I didn't do that. I just made it work. Or at least I thought I just made it work. I got it rendering down, say, two minutes, down to a minute. And eventually, it was like almost a second. So at that point, I pushed it to production. And I'm happy with it. I gave it to the clients. They're still not happy. Like, what on earth? It works on my machine. You know, it's a common phrase. And although this was 15 years ago, I had this issue just a few months back. And I also heard the phrase, it works on my machine, just two days ago in the workshop. So it's as pertinent today as it was 15 years ago. So anyway, I went up to the client's office, and what did I see? They had these archaic machines. So it's any wonder it wasn't running. As a developer, you'll always have probably the best machine out there. You know, it's really powerful. You've got to remember your clients probably don't have that. So if you speak to your clients, you need to understand what they're running it on. So it's a key thing there, is just remember what the device will be that whatever it is you're creating is going to be running on. So essentially, need to take ownership. You know, I was the one with the expertise coming in. I should have said, no, I'm not going to just tweak it. I'm going to fix it properly. Speak to your customer or clients. Too often we don't really do that. We ignore the stakeholders or we just do what we want to do and stop to think about what you're doing. Now, 
a little bit later on this firm, redundancy again, but this time I was more prepared for it. And this is where I got my big break, as I would say. So the work was drying up. What do I do? Well, I created my own website, just a blog post, and I was digging into the code. I was doing Adobe Flex at the time. It was really big. So I spent as much time doing little code snippets, tutorials, wizards, you name it. It'd be a bit like today, you looking at React 18 and seeing the latest hooks are coming out and making examples around those. So I'd thoroughly recommend you do that just so then you get to know the code inside and out. And that's what then gives you that knowledge to then go away. At this point, I either went into the contracting world because contractors generally jump into a, a bad situation and fix it. And by knowing code inside and out, you can get to do that. And then people will trust you with what they're doing. Now, past two stories have been kind of a bit depressing, I've made redundant in both of them, because you know, that's what happens at times. I come to this place called a crazy place and it's for a good reason, but it's all positive. Like, look at this, this guy's got a gas mask on in the office. This is long before COVID was ever a thing. Like, why did you get a gas mask on? Again, we were at a mobile development company and lots of tablets. This was our stand-up. Sometimes we worked remotely, sometimes we didn't. Guy there with a balaclava on. Now, this was a Belfast, so if you know a bit of Belfast, you might understand why, but it's just a bit of fun. We'd go out to lunch together, whole team, go to the shops, come back, play some games, have food, chat. Sometimes did team days out, went fishing on a boat. And we also, this is a very important thing I would say as a team overall, marking your milestones. Now, what we were doing in this place, it wasn't released yet, but we were marking certain milestones that were going along. So, you know, someone would bring in a cake, maybe a couple of bottles or something. We'd also celebrate people's birthdays. Just little things before the day got going, a wee team thing, and that matters. So why am I saying it matters? Because development isn't always about coding. It's about building a collaborative environment where you can be friends with people and get along. Now consider this. You've made a fix for something. You've done some task. You've pushed, it had been peer reviewed. It's gone up and it's about to go into a release. That release also has some critical things the clients are looking for. And then a little bit while later, you realize there's a bug in the code. And you're like, oh no, what do I do? This thing has to go out. And I don't know how major this bug is. At that point, the correct thing to do is tell your team. To say, spotted an issue, can we all do a huddle, do some programming, peer programming, whatever, fix it, figure it out. That's only possible if you're in an environment where you trust each other and you're not going to get blamed. If you're in a blame environment where people point fingers and say it's your fault, then what would happen and has happened is that person tries to hide it. Goes into production and then they go, well, it's not my fault. You peer reviewed it. You know, it's a bad situation. So you must have a collaborative environment, which leads on to my next kind of point about being kind. Now, this is obviously a very generalized sort of comment, be kind, but you can apply it to so many points in your daily life. Peer reviews, you know, if you're going to see some code, always put something nice into it. You know, if it's a nice method, a nice bit of clean code going on, just say, this is really nice. And the same thing, if you're seeing some code and you think, I really don't like that, and you're going to put 20 comments against it, just don't do it. Stand up, walk across the person and just say, have you got two minutes? You know, and then maybe do some peer programming. And that way you're both learning, you can see what their point of view is, and they can see what yours is. And it just makes it less combative. And that way you get a much nicer environment. And the music, I mentioned the headphones. This place had a, what I would say is a really good solution. It doesn't work in every environment, but in this one, it was perfect. They had one machine set up purely for Spotify. Now, what happened is the developer would come in and put their favorite artists in. And the whole day, it would just play everybody's music. So no one had headphones on, but you still got your music. So if you needed to get in the zone, that was fine. But if someone needed to speak to you, again, that was fine. You weren't in your bubble with your headphones. So if you can try that and you're a headphone kind of wearing company, definitely try and get a separate machine just for that. Now, we reached the long run, 10 years in one place. Now, there's obviously way too much to squeeze in the remaining minutes here, you know, so it's like 10 years. So I'm currently at a place called JP Morgan and it's a massive firm essentially, but with it being massive, you do get plus sort of things and negative things. For example, you've obviously got lots of bureaucracy, red tape, multi-managers, you name it. But at the same time, you have the benefits. This company it pumps in literally billions into 
technology every year. You know, three billion in technical innovation alone. Like that's just massive. And the benefits of that is you get time to do something right. You know, there's obviously times you've broken something that happens. But if you get time to do it right, then hopefully it doesn't break too often. I work in the Glasgow office and it's gone from like five hundred to two and a half thousand. You know, it's constantly expanding. You know, and if you ever did want to move from one place to another, you can do that. I've got colleagues that have gone from Glasgow down to like London or even New York for that matter. So we'll come on to my top tips from uh, working here. COVID has changed the office environment quite a bit. You know, in the past, you'd be in your chair, you'd swing round, I'd go to my colleague, hey Garth, I've got an issue, you've got two minutes. You can't do that as easily now because we're virtual. You know, we, some people do go in the office, some people don't. So how do we get around this? Our team, what we did was we had a separate machine. So I've got an office in my house and I've got a separate machine, which is purely for Zoom. So in the mornings, we'd have a put on Zoom, we'd have a catch up, just as if you're meeting in the kitchen for a cup of tea or whatever. You do that and you then have your stand up and you leave it up the whole day. Now, yes, you put yourself on mute, but it's there. So if I want to turn around to my colleague, I can just turn around to my other machine and say, hey, Garth, you got two minutes. And if he does, then he just unmutes ourselves and we just have a chat. So it's the exact same, but it's virtual. But having a separate machine, which is not on your development machine, makes sure that you can have it on the whole time. And I would say that we're very visual people. You know, we need to have, we have a conversation, you need to see their, their expressions. So, and this goes against the grain for a lot of people, is having a webcam on the whole time. You feel a bit conscious, but after a while, you get used to it. And it was a great, sort of leveler, leveler and kept us this sort of cohesive team, even though everybody was miles and miles apart. Another thing that we do is we do events. Here you can be we're seen digging some ponds in a wildlife park. Like what on earth is that got to do with code? Nothing really. But this had a direct impact the following week for me because I was chatting with guys as we're digging these holes and then I needed a favour done in the office the next week. And if it wasn't for knowing these people, it might take me a couple of days to find the right people to get the task done. As it was, it was a five minute job, sorted. We also have smaller, random, fun things. Instigated a Friday question, where essentially people just ask one random question on a Friday morning, and then it has to be something you don't know the answer to. For example, one of the questions was, what's the deepest sauna in the world? Or how deep is the deepest sauna in the world? You know, and unless you're from Finland, you probably don't know the answer to that. And then later on in the afternoon, you give out the answer, and then people have a chat online and also in some of our text chat rooms. And what ended up happening was someone then shared a tip for an internal system, and then someone else shared a tip for one of the internal systems. And before you know it, there was half a dozen or more tips on our various systems that people didn't know about previous to this. So although this was just a random conversation with people having a bit of fun on a Friday afternoon, it led to a direct positive impact on the whole team. Now, depending on the size of the organisation, it's good to find a separate niche that isn't code. For example, and where I'm coming to with this is you can perhaps do local charity work. A lot of the guys go to schools and help children to code, which is ideal. You know, they might be interested in doing mentoring, how to do teaching. So again, graduates come into the office and you can take part in a programme to do the mentoring. Or hardware groups. Maybe you're wanting to learn a different language. There's lots of multiple groups and you can lead these groups. So you're helping to spread your knowledge and do something outside of your day-to-day -day job. And it makes your job more fun. You know, like, what's better than getting paid to do what you enjoy and also helping others at the same time? For me, I did a bit of intellectual property. And what I've got up here was something that I didn't do this till perhaps the past three years or so. And some of us recognising the work that I was doing. And I got a trip round the Isle of Wight, down the south of England, doing a yacht race, completely random, but purely because you're doing something extra and you're giving something back to people. You know, so finding your niche outside your day job, if you can do that, then just go for it. Now, coming on to this uh, one thing, as I said, you know, it took a while to sort of formulate this kind of idea, but this one thing I think that makes your work a little bit more interesting. So, interesting or interested. Now, 
What could I possibly mean by that? Essentially, social media perhaps has a, makes people focus more on themselves and it kind of has negative consequences because people are trying to be interesting. Whereas, you know, maybe you're more interested in people. You know, you'll probably know people that might want to say, go somewhere cool and take a photograph of coffee just to make themselves look interesting. Where it'd be much better to be interested in somebody and take them out for coffee. So it's one of those reverse benefit kind of things. A bit like Christmas, it's much better to give a present than it is to get one. And like one of the examples I had was when I was at the crazy place, it was one week I wasn't feeling too well, and one of the developers just gave me a gym pass so I can go get a swim and a sauna just to relax. Like he was genuinely interested in my well-being for no reason. He didn't want me to work more or whatever. He was just making sure that I was doing good. So being interested in people is one of these things where you can then just have a direct impact on your team and your colleagues don't then just become colleagues, they're then your friends at the same time. And that's what you want. You want to become friendly with people so that when you go in on Monday morning, it's fun. Now, obviously all you guys here are interested in React and JavaScript, so you all have that in common. And I know the, the JavaScript, the software world, is quite a small world at times. The number of people I've bumped into along the way from a start of my career, I then see later on, you know. So I would challenge you to go and speak to people and just say hello to at least one person you don't know. And that one person you may find end up being your next colleague and your next friend. So and with that, thanks for listening.